In the decades from 1887 to 1919, a hitherto unknown cactus, unknown at least to Western science, was transformed into a chemically pure substance called mescaline. How did science approach the unknown? Which disciplines were involved and in what succession? By answering these questions, I want to figure out how the excessively restricted view on mescaline as some sort of psychotic agent came about. During this research boom from 1919, during this research boom from 1919 onwards, which was precipitated by the first fully artificial synthesis of mescaline by the Viennese chemist Ernst Speth, mescaline was, one could say, quite successfully put under quarantine. Since it was mainly the institution of psychiatry that dealt with the seemingly weird effects of this psychedelic prototype. Under the label of psychotomimetic, mescaline then was mainly used as a research tool in order to better understand this most terrible of all human sicknesses, madness. It is important to note that during this second period of research, from about 1920 to 1940, the drug mescaline was generally not considered to be of any therapeutic value. And what's more, by confining the investigations to a pathologizing perspective on mescaline, its existential or spiritual potential, as well as its cultural significance, was implicitly diffused. And I want to argue it was the period before this confinement, namely 1887 to 1919, which prepared the stage for things to come or not to come. So uh, that's research as done between the years uh, 1887 and 1919. And I don't have much time to go into that, but uh, here you see there was a wide range of disciplines involved. And, and there's the time span, and, um, and it was as well in the States as well as in Europe where they uh, approached masculine or the cactus. But for today, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I uh, have to focus on this, I will focus on this area uh, only. So, my title actually should be Primil Preliminary Remarks on the Genealogy of Mescaline, with uh, special reference to the humanities from 1905 to 1914. After Arthur Hefter managed to identify the main psychoactive part and to isolate mescaline from the cactus in 1898, this being, as you know, the first identification of a psychedelic substance on a molecular level, scientific, scientific testing on humans with mescaline, respectively the cactus as a whole or some of its derivatives, came to a temporary standstill. This is all the more strange considering the fact that all the researchers so far came to the anonymous conclusion that this substance seems to be very promising, though, as we will see, they did not really agree in what respect particularly. It took more than seven years for the testing of mescaline on human subjects after Hefter's uh, breakthrough to be resumed again, this time in Europe, more precisely in the city of Wroclaw in the southwest of Poland, then part of the German Empire. These experiments were conducted by Dr. Johannes Bresler, who, by the way, turned out to be a prototypical Nazi psychiatrist in the years to come. Bresler injected his subjects with anhalonin, that is the tincture which was prepared by Levin for the first time in 1888, and which was now available by mail order from the pharmaceutical company E. Merck in Darmstadt. Bresler was well aware of the research tradition that had already built up around this strange cactus before the turn of the century. He recapitulates these experiments and then proceeds to describe his own findings. Of course, states Bresler in advance, I did inform the subjects, five mentally ill patients about the toxic side effects of the substance, but naturally not, he adds, about the visions that it produces. Shortly after Frau Sch, S-E-H, 
one of his uh, five research subjects had been injected with anhalonin. She had a series of visions, which quite obviously were of a spiritual or religious character. She was totally overwhelmed by first seeing the communion wafer somewhere floating in the air. Then, after some pressure on her eyeballs, obviously exerted by Dr. Bresler, she saw, quote, a smoking device as used in churches. And not much later, she even had a vision of the mother of God in a golden gown. All of this, as goes without saying, not, was not at all taken seriously by Dr. Bresler. Whereas psychiatry in general plays an important role in the flattening of the vertical guiding difference between sacred and profane to the horizontal plane with the main coordinates normal on the one and pathological on the other hand, this naturally becomes especially dramatic when supposedly entheogenic substances like mescaline enter the stage. But for now, I want to close the Bracelet case by pointing out that the nonetheless that he nonetheless sees some therapeutic potential for the substance, although only on a symptomatic level. Quote, another possibility would be to suppress persistent excruciating visual distortions, at least temporarily, by mescal visions. The next researcher experimenting with mescaline was Alvin Knauer, who did his experiments mostly at the Grepelin Institute in Munich. Knauer's experiments were the most extensive research endeavor during this period. However, the only thing that's left of this is the summary of a lecture he gave at the meeting of the Bavarian Doctors of the Insane, held at Pentecost of the year 1911. And additionally, we also have a paper co-written by J.M.A. Maloney from Fordham University, New York, that was published in 1913. This paper has the title, Preliminary Remarks on the Psychic Action of Mescaline, with special reference to the mechanism of hallucination. Back to 1911. Knauer's Pentecost lecture presented some results of experiments that were done with nine doctors as research subjects. As far as I can tell, these really were the first experiments done with isolated, the isolated substance as such. The effects, as described by Knauer, were quite similar to the experiments done so far with the cactus itself, or some derivatives of it, and Knauer seems to take their identical symptomatic for granted. In their preliminary remarks again, Knauer and Maloney report that all in all they did 23 experiments on a number of physicians. Part of this was a differential diagnosis with alcohol, wherewith it was found out while a certain feeling of increased mental capacity is typical for both, it only could be objectively validated in the case of mescaline. In the same year when this article was published in the American Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, one of Knauer's research subjects, Alfred Serko, came, anachronistically spoken, out of the psychedelic closet by presenting a personal account of his experience at the lecture in Vienna. The psychologist Serko wrote his PhD thesis on the question of substance in Spinoza, no pun intended, explicitly stated at the beginning of his talk that in order to not come into conflict with the conclusions of Knauer, he wanted to focus on a description of the subjective effects of this very strange drug. He then went on not to only speak about visual hallucinations, but also gave some space to the emotive aspect of his experience. Serko emphatically described that he had felt the will, quote, to hack the whole world, a mental state that was similar to the period of recovery after a long sickness, end quote. He also stated that although to the outsider the visions might seem to be completely chaotic, the first-hand experience, however, is accompanied by some sense of order. Quote, there is some system in this up and down of visions that is apparent. He even attributed this regulatory capacity to some productive spirit. Meanwhile, in Russia, 1912, Dr. Arthur Weber published six trip reports in the St. Petersburger Medizinische Zeitschrift. He admitted that he did not actually know what it exactly was that he administered to his test subjects. 
Either it was grinded mezcal buttons or the compound as sold by the compound as sold by Merck. Uh, Merck. Because of this uncertainty, Weber naturally had difficulties finding the right dosage. Nonetheless, the drug obviously worked pretty well. The aim of Weber's experiments was explicitly to find out whether the cactus or its derivatives could be used for inducing artificial insanity. It is especially the phenomenon of being double, which is, as Weber states, of great importance with regard to psychic disturbances, as well as for the understanding of wonderful folk tales, folk tales new and old, that he was interested in. However, the cactus, or anhalonin, did not turn out to be very useful in this rather special respect. The experiments conducted by Alfred Gutmann in Berlin Wannsee are, once again, only available secondhand via the summary of a lecture he held in Göttingen, April 1914, three months before World War I broke out. There it was reported that Gutmann got a handful of specimens of the cactus by some Dr. Hornbostel, and that Louis Levin was not only so kind to confirm their identity, but also sent some anhalonin. Whether Goodman and his fellow Dr. K did both at once, or whether they did their experiments first with the former, then with the latter, cannot be said with certainty with just the summary at hand. All in all, the two of them seem to have, seem to have had pretty good times, especially for Goodman. The experience was rather exhilarating, and even some, quote, grotesque, even disturbing hallucinations, end quote, were diffused by the generally good mute he was in during the intoxication. The two supposedly also had an interesting talk well into the night, and Goodman stated that he got up the next morning, quote, without any signs of hangover. As a conclusion, he suggests that this indeed might turn out to be a very important tool for the study of, quote, abnormal mental states, especially due to the fact that the mind stays clear and critical during these strange experiences. This, according to Goodman, has the great advantage of getting a first-hand account of an experience that otherwise is only available through the reports of the statements of patients by psychiatrists. For my research interest, however, dealing with the statements as given by the psychiatrists of these times is of heuristic value. Since I am mostly interested in what is mediated through their perspective. What in their eyes is worth mentioning? What can be left out? How and with which scientific means did they approach the experience? How did they present it? And what did they think about it? So, from the period, period from uh, 1905 to 1914, so the period, sorry, the period from 1905 to 1914 is definitely not the best place to get a good picture of the masculine experience as such, with the exception of the very elaborate account of Alfred Serko. But it is interesting for analyzing the gatekeeping function of some psychiatrists. Together with scientists of other disciplines, they thereby helped to build the foundation of the rubber room that Europe went to become between the wars, at least in regard to masculine. Thank you.